the time for that. <laughs> That's a reminder. Yeah. So the last time we looked at the conscience and how it works. And uh, I want to review that briefly and then transition into talking about guilt and shame and other related terms. So just for kind of some review, <clears throat> what is the role of the conscience? Michael's. Michael. Right. Yes. Um, you've still got this thing sitting in the middle of my screen. Click on continue. Yeah, you can just click on it to continue. Uh, yeah. Oh, I didn't want to click on it because I didn't want to leave. Oh, continue. Yeah, I was in the same boat. <laughs> uh, okay, I didn't see it. So. Oh, okay, that's, well. that's probably an option for you to, to leave if you don't want to be recorded or something like that. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Axel. Yeah, no problem. Hmm. Maybe. Maybe it's something new. <clears throat> yeah. Is that something new? Yeah, because I'm seeing a recording in on my it screen is. now. Oh, uh, I did raise my hand. Oh. Uh, yeah, the, the, the role of the conscience is to uh, tell us if we're, if we're doing something right or wrong, to, to uh, differentiate between right and wrong. Okay, good. Yeah, to point out sin or potentially falling into sin. Good. Anything else? <clears throat> uh, uh, Gary? maybe it's it's it has it has a lot to do with that enmity that god has promised us that he has placed in our hearts uh to react you know to be sensitive uh toward being able to feel what is right what is wrong to know what is right and what is wrong okay good the enmity um, we don't always react in the right way regarding that, but it's it's there, put there by God to, and it's connected to our conscience, yes. Okay, anything else? <clears throat> Axel? I, I just thought maybe, yeah, I just thought um, probably the conscience creates that sensitivity to um, spiritual things, but then I'm thinking a bit further, what if you become, um, what's the word, De desensitized, you're no longer sensitive. Is that the point at which you become spiritually dead or your probation closes? Yeah, I think the, um, the conscience, I don't think it just uh, is on and then suddenly turns off. It more like it fades, I would say. Um, so as you resist the call of your conscience, um, it's like any bodily function, really. Um, lose it or lose it, right? But it's a gradual thing. And God is yeah. not cutting off yeah. our ability to respond to him. We do it ourselves by not properly responding. So. Is it sort of like um, ignoring yeah. the conscience and yet carrying on? It's almost like grieving away the Holy Spirit. Sure. Yeah, the Holy Spirit speaks to us through our conscience. Uh, Michael? I, I just just going to say that I, I suspect the conscience is always there. It's just that we are repressing it. Sure. It's, it's, it's always it's like the spirit. It's there. We're being upheld. Yes. Um, but it's just that we we just put it into the background and leave it there. Yes. Um, okay. So the role of the conscience is to point out sins. I think to point out potential of falling into sin you've probably all had the experience of almost doing something wrong and your conscience uh kicks in at the right moment hopefully it says don't do that yeah it says don't do that and hopefully you respond the right way and uh, it can also help us to realize our need of a savior too because our conscience you know if you think uh you know there's people who do that you think oh i'm no good or whatever i'm not worthy in a sense, that's conscience, but it's not conscience doing the right thing, really. Um, while we're not worthy, um, you know, we have a savior that will save us in spite of that. And um, we'll talk about that uh, more today. Um, so the meaning of the conscience is not, this is what I showed last time, it's not so different between the two gospel models 
the main and very important difference is in how a person achieves a clear conscience. And I had a diagram last time, but I think I've improved on it here. Um, so I'm just going to show this. So this is the biblical healing model. And then below, I will share the same thing in what I call the traditional legal model. So the, the, the conscience, this little pink box here, is part of the mind. And in this first case, the conscience has an understanding of the biblical healing model. The input to the conscience is an awareness of our sin, whether it's something we've done or perhaps are contemplating doing. And the output from our conscience, when it's understanding the biblical healing model, if we actually commit a sin, is guilt. You know, the guilt is there for a reason. But it's also um, awe of God in the sense of we have an understanding of his ever-present mercy and that he does forgive us. He does not hold our sins against us. And because of that, we can have gratitude for God's mercy. And when we experience guilt, we can instantly ask for help because we know it's available. Um, Axel? Um, is all the all that you're speaking of, is it the same as respect, um, reverence? And yes, yes. That sort of thing? As distinct from fear. Um, the word, and we'll see that in the diagram below. Yeah. Fear is sometimes used as in phobia, to be afraid, or it can also mean awe, uh, which is reverence or respect. So when one understands the biblical healing model, they realize that God does not require payment for sin, and that forgiveness is always freely offered. The conscience need not be bothered with continued guilt for sins. Its promptings, that is the conscience's promptings, are only meant to alert us to our need to find a solution to our sin and to our condition. Okay? So compare that with the uh, how the conscience functions in the traditional legal model. Again, you've got the mind, uh, including the conscience, with an understanding of the traditional legal model. And awareness of sin is the input. The output, again, is going to be guilt. But a difference here is rather than awe of God because of the knowledge of his mercy, it's fear of God. What's he going to do to me? You know, now I'm subject to punishment. And the solution or the, for guilt is sacrifice. And the fear of God will make us feel that we need to appease God's wrath. Um, so within this model, the solution to bring about atonement or a solution is to offer a sacrifice to appease God's wrath. That sacrifice was either an animal substitute or, after the cross, an acceptance of the sacrifice of God's son on the sinner's behalf. So in other words, believing that he paid the penalty to his father. In some systems, even without human sacrifice, some form of penance as payment on the part of the sinner was required or is required. And I think of when I was thinking of this, I thought of the confessional. I was raised Roman Catholic and would occasionally go to confessional and confess my sins. And within the Catholic system, uh, Christ paid the penalty by his death. And yet I was still required after confessing sins to do a penance, to say so many this prayer or that prayer. It just struck me as I wrote this that it's like double dipping. You know, the, the payment has been made and yet I'm required to pay again. So, um, another option compared to these two understandings is that the sinner does not even seek for a solution for his sin and guilt, but continues in impenitence. So that's a complete disregard for the problem. You know, I feel guilt, but who cares? I'm not going to do anything about it. Uh, let's, if someone could read this verse, uh, Romans 2, 5, please. Uh, Gary. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasure us up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Okay. Um, does anyone want to take a stab at explaining that verse, like how the wrath ties into it? Oh. 
the ones greater? Well, if you don't, if you're impenitent means you're not asking for forgiveness. You're just going along and the wrath is, isn't that God's turning away? And we're, you know, if you turn away from him and don't ask for forgiveness, then you're just, he will eventually leave. Yes, you're setting yourself up for God leaving you in the final judgment. And he's leaving an, an impenitent person is his wrath. And we've, we've gone over that before, of course. <clears throat> okay, so very good. Um, so do those diagrams kind of make sense? Yes. Yeah. I'm always looking to improve yes. on this if I can. <clears throat> so when you do something wrong towards yeah. someone, uh -huh. uh, you hurt them physically, financially, or emotionally, what do you think, what do you think they feel towards you? Anger. Anger, okay, anything else? Hurt. Hurt, okay, they're hurt, um, certainly. And, you know, we could add similar words, but what causes us to think that way, to think that they're feeling uh, hurt or angry? <laughs> it's usually the way we feel we we project it on them yeah exactly exactly good but we tend to think that way or uh, we do so we we put that on other people too that's the way we feel when we are wrong so we tend and actually we tend to put our own thoughts on god as well we imagine him to act and react as we do okay there's a sense in which people try to make God out to be in their own image instead of the other way around. <clears throat> so when we can stop having negative feelings, uh, resentment, desire for revenge, dislike, hatred, etc., towards others who have hurt us, it will help us to not think that God has the same attitude towards us. Okay? Can you see that we tend to mix our feelings with how we understand God to feel towards us. We tend to project our feelings. Yeah. Yes. God. yeah. Uh, so, and when we can understand and accept that God does not have negative feelings towards us, it makes it easier to be forgiving towards others. And in a sense, that's a cycle that reinforces itself. And I made a little sort of a graph here. Michael, go ahead. I was just thinking here, um, your comment, when we can stop having negative feelings, resentment, desire for revenge, dislike and hatred toward others who have hurt us, but we can have those feelings towards anyone who, ha who has not hurt us. Yes. Sort of. We can resent, right? We can. It can. It's not just that someone's done something to us or me that I'm going to think negative things against them. Right. We can go spend all our life having negative thoughts on other people who have really not done anything to touch us at all. Yeah. So, it, it, you know what I'm trying to say here? This is part of our human nature. Sure. I think of um, like racism or something like that. Um, you know, people will dislike Jews okay. because they're Jewish. Right. They've never done anything wrong to them. They don't even know the person. Um, yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. Um, so in the sense, it's a cycle that reinforces itself. And so I've made a little graph here. If, if in our perception, God has bad feelings toward me, it's more likely that I will have bad feelings toward others. Does that make uh -huh. sense? So a direct relationship between them. So the, the more we can have a correct understanding of God's character and understand the fact that he does not have negative feelings towards us, it makes it easier for us to react in the same way towards others. So in other words, a correct understanding of God's character will have a big effect on our interpersonal relations. Even if they hurt us. So. Even if they yeah. hurt us, yes. And, and I've found this, maybe I've been able to do it to some extent, but it is very freeing 
to not harbor ill feelings towards others. Okay, we know that. Um, how do you term it? You know, if you hate someone, it, it eats you up, up from the inside. You know, it's very hurtful to have those sorts of feelings. So if you can uh, avoid having them, your health will even improve. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, sort of to illustrate how readily we feel like that, how we want our pound of flesh and how our secular culture has bought into the legal system of dealing with sins. I just put this example here. We hear it on the radio and I, I don't know the name, but there's a top Canadian military commander who was uh, recently accused of sexual offenses dating back like 30 years. And the demand, maybe you've heard of that guy or know his name even. Um, the demand is that justice must be done. Well, you know, maybe he's gotten over that. It was 30 years ago. Maybe he's better now. It's like we have to see that every yeah. sin is punished rather than remedy the condition. And we, we really should be more concerned with a person's current condition than any past disorders. Sorry, Julia's getting the phone. Absolutely. There's, 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 there's no room for forgiveness, is there, in society? There's just none. It yeah, doesn't matter what you've done. Yeah, not very much. But it's interesting. I'm going to share with you now uh, what to do with it. Um, an example, and I forgot to bring it up. I forgot to find the file. Give me a sec here. <clears throat> I might not be able to find this, but <clears throat> this is kind of interesting. Just, just give me a sec here. <clears throat> no. Uh, and it was an example of the people of Ubuntu, which is some tribe somewhere, okay. might be Australia. Remember. And uh, when someone committed uh, an offense to the community, rather than uh, punish them, they would gather around them for two days and tell the person how good he is, recount all the good things he has done. And this is similar, I guess, um, what's the term for it? You know, it's to um, reassure the person. That's not the right word. Um, this is actually the opposite of our modern justice system, which tells the person how bad he is. You know, he must be punished. In this case, it's telling them he's, he's actually a good person. You can do better. Now, we know that Scripture says um, everyone is evil, basically, but everyone has potential to be good. And this, um, you know, restorative justice, that's the word I'm looking for. A restorative justice system um, helps to reinforce that. And sorry, if I find the picture later, I'll, I'll bring it up again. So those are two extremes of justice. Which? Do you think of those two extremes would be God's preference in dealing with transgression? God is tribal in this case. Okay, God is tribal in that case. Good. Um, we're all part of his tribe. Okay, and he's trying to, to keep us in that. And, um, another is an illustration by Tim Jennings, and I would have looked for it, but He's got so much material that would have taken me forever. But he talks about a person, I think the context was he was applying for a job. And someone said, and it was maybe in the medical system or something, and someone on the, the board, the hiring board said, you can't hire him. He, he was really sick. You know, I saw him many years ago and he was throwing up and he was sick and he was terrible. And you're going to put him in the medical system? And the person at the head of the um, interview board said, well, that was 30 years ago. How is he now? is healed. It's not an issue. 
And the same really applies both in health and in our spiritual life. If we're healed, that's what God is concerned about. He's not worried about some sin we committed 30 years ago. It's the present condition that matters. You know, when God proposes to take a certain person into heaven, the angels aren't going to worry about what he did way in his youth. Is he safe to save now? Is he safe to have walking up on the streets of gold? That's the important thing. A um, couple of thoughts about how God relates to us when we sin. Um, I put up here sins in sound. What am I referring to there? I'm talking too much this morning. A woman caught in adultery. Okay. Mary Magdalene. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So what's what's how does God relate to sin in that case? Privately. Privately, in the sense that he did not expose her accusers openly of their sins. He wrote it in maybe That's right. some code, some little symbol, something they would recognize, and they say, "Whoops, I'm guilty," and they sneak away one by one. He didn't do it openly. Uh, what about Simon's feast? Remember that feast at Simon's house? Uh, and Mary Magdalene was involved there too, actually. Is there an example, similar example there of how he relates to sin? Yeah, he kind of knew what was in Simon's heart and what Simon was thinking, but he didn't expose him to all the other guests there. He just told a parable. <clears throat> okay, he told a parable which Simon understood and was able to relate to himself mm -hmm. because he was accusing this, this woman anointing Yeshua's feet, uh, accusing her of being, a, of being a sinner, which of course she was, but so was he. And yeah. she was openly admitting her yeah. sin. Uh, Michael. Yeah. Yeshua also knew what was in her heart and he wasn't exposing that in terms of what she did, what she was. Right. Right. So he's all for what we can be. Yes. For what we will be, yes. for what we are becoming. Yes, not what we were. Not our sick past, but our right. potential of a good future. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's wonderful. It's very freeing to, to know that God does not accuse us. What about, uh, this is sort of similar, uh, Nathan exposing David's sin. Nathan the prophet went into Daniel to David. Um, he didn't expose David's sin. He kept it to him. He kept it private with David. He wasn't exposed. Yeah. Now I know we, what you're trying to say, Raven. Yeah. We don't know that there was anyone else present at the time, but same thing as Simon in a way. He told the parable. Yeah. Um, in this case, there was no one else around that David would be embarrassed by having them hear the story. But mm. Nathan got David to condemn himself, basically. To recognize his own sin. So it's interesting to recognize that God is not out to embarrass us, okay, or expose our sins to anyone else. He wants us to recognize that we're sinners, absolutely, and to go to Him for forgiveness and help. So we should not carry around guilt for our past issues, I don't believe, issues and behaviors that have been resolved. However, if you're still engaged in a bad habit, you obviously need to deal with it. Okay, you should make that distinction. Okay, so, you know, if you did something years ago and it comes back to your mind and you feel guilty about it all over again, who's doing that? Is that the Holy Spirit or is that Satan? Okay. If you've confessed and forsaken that, but it comes back again in your memory and, you, you know, you think, oh, Father, forgive me, I should have never done that. <laughs> So who's, who's prompting you in that case? Well, who does scripture say is the, the accuser? accuser yeah. yes, there's, there's an answer. Yeah. And it's just to annoy us, you know. Um, we're already forgiven, so we don't need to ask for forgiveness again. Okay, so let's talk a bit more about guilt and shame. Um, there are verses that read like God will not excuse anyone for misbehavior. Let's read Exodus 20 and verse 7. Uh, Paul. 
You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Okay, so is that saying that God will not forgive? Not no. hold guiltless sounds like he will hold guilty. So will God forgive that? Yes. Okay, yes. Thank you, Jerry. I think what he's saying there is that he will not step in and stop or suppress or prevent the naturally occurring consequences of dysfunctional behavior. Oh, okay, good, good, good. Um, consequences is a big thing here. And this next verse, Exodus 34, 7, I think brings that out even more clearly. So some could read that, please. Exodus 34, 7. I got it. Okay, Gary. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgive iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, unto the third and to the fourth generation. Okay, is that making a distinction between um, the guilty and the innocent? Yeah. Okay, um, in a way it is and in a way it isn't because the words, the guilty there <clears throat> are actually added words. Okay, they're not in the original text. Yeah, that's true. And the reason they're in there, I think, is the translators reading that saw visiting the iniquity as punishment and you only punish the guilty. So they put in the guilty, but it should read keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means cancel the consequences we could put in, perhaps. This is relating to what Gary said. Whether you're guilty or not, you're going to experience the consequences of what you did, okay? And this actually relates to genetics because when the fathers maybe develop a um, abusive towards their wife um, habit or something like that, that will actually imprint genetically um, through epigenetics and the, their children and their children and their children will all have that tendency, okay? And that's what that's relating to. So again, it's, um, he allows the consequences of actions to happen and he will not interfere with them. Okay, let's read uh, Ezekiel 22.4. And we're going to look at the cause of shame. Got it. Okay, Judy, how's it? You have become <clears throat> guilty by the blood which you have shed and have defiled yourself with the idols which you have made. You have caused your days to draw near and have come up, come to the end of your years. Therefore, I have made you a reproach to the nations and a mockery to all countries. Okay. So you have become guilty. That word guilty, the Hebrew word for guilt is actually a sham. Okay. Which is where we get the English word a shame. Okay. So guilt and shame are very closely related. Um, in, in the dictionary, an online dictionary, shame is defined as the painful feeling arising from the consciousness of something dishonorable, improper, ridiculous, etc., done by oneself or another. And you could be, feel shame for what, say, a young child does, you know, so it relates to another person as well, um, because you would be, feel somewhat responsible as a parent. In uh, Webster's dictionary, the 1828 dictionary, it says for shame, a painful sensation excited by a consciousness of guilt. So you can see there the close relationship between uh, shame and guilt. It's guilt that causes shame and that should cause it a painful sensation. Now it's not physically painful, but it's painful to our 
to our mind, to our psyche. Um, it's interesting. It can become very... Go ahead, Michael. Sorry, Ryan. It can become very uh, physical, <clears throat> ultimately, okay. depending on how you're relating to it in your mind. Yes. Because 90% of, 90 of illness is psychosomatic, right? Yeah, good. Okay. So it's not that it causes immediate pain like uh, hammering your finger is, but it's a chronic thing that definitely over time can affect health, um, perhaps even worse than physical pain. Good. Uh, the Bible also, in referring to uh, guilt, uses the term confusion of faiths or confusion of faces. Okay, that's what that's referring to. Um, so we not we know what shame is, but what what does it do? Why did God, in His wisdom, give man the capacity to experience the emotion of shame? Any thoughts, sir? We can only experience. not want to experience it. Sorry, say that again, Gary. <laughs> he gave it to us so that we would not want to experience it. Okay, so it's a protection. Uh, yeah, okay, he made it painful, so we would avoid yeah. it. Okay, that's good. Um, so we'd learn from it. Okay, so we would learn from it. Um, I might have this down here later, but pain is given to us kind of in the same way. Um, you know, if you hit your thumb with a hammer, there's pain there. And uh, when it heals and you go back to work, you'll be more careful the next time. As, uh, it's a protection for us. Um, I think let's stop there. We're going to get into something else. Let's take a break at this point and come back in 10 minutes. So at 11, 12 and try me back on time. I want to talk as soon as we come back about our ongoing meetings here uh, in relationship to the possibility of in-person meetings. So let's take a break for 10 minutes here. What's that voice again? <laughs> okay, so where were we? Uh, talking about shame, definitions there. Um, so shame is rooted in guilt. There's a very close connection between them. Uh, the guilt offering of Leviticus 5 is known as the asham. And here we can see the concept of and the relationship between guilt and shame. Um, okay, let's, let's I'll jump back up, but let's go down to Leviticus 5 verses five and six. Uh, Michael. And it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin, which he has sinned a female of the flock, a lamb, or a kid of the goats, for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning the sin. Okay, good. So you can see the connection between guilt and, and trespass offering. They're actually from almost the same word. That's kind of interesting. Mm. Um, I probably shouldn't have jumped down like that. But anyway, let's go back here. Um, Okay, here is the Hebrew for the word shame. Okay, it's spelled, and you start from the right. I'm, I might do this once in a while, and you can learn a few little bits of Hebrew. I don't know very much, but that's an aleph, and then a shin, and then a mem. Oops, shouldn't have done that. Oh, I messed it up. Big time. Okay, I messed up the other way, but um, it's hard to fix because the, the Hebrews got a different order. I'll fix that later. Oh, it fixed itself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is the um, Hebrew for Hebrew word asham, which means shame. 
And if you take the, the root word for that, it's this word, which is a left shim, so without the mem on it. And that is the word for fire. Okay. And let me just, I'm just going to jump to something else here. Okay, this is, um, okay, this is my ebook, The Lake of Fire and the Second Death, which I've recently got in hard copy. If you don't, anyone doesn't have a copy and wants it, I can send one. And in there, I've got some of this. And here is the word, this is another word, but it's the word for man. And it's a left yod shin, so quite similar to this. And if you take out the yod, which is the Hebrew letter, the Hebrew letter for God, then you're left with this, a left shim, which is the word for fire. So in other words, the absence of God within man results in fire. Okay. Which is quite interesting. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Um, and the same similarly works for the word for woman actually too um okay so back here the aleph shim the aleph is uh in the paleo hebrew is the head of an ox which is signifying strength and the shim is like teeth you can kind of see three projections out here like three teeth you know, like this um so it's something that is strong and devours, and that represents fire. The Paleo Hebrew is very interesting how the meanings of the letters tie into the meanings of the words that they're put together into. So one aspect of the Hebrew letter mem, that's this leftmost one up here, um, is chaos or turbulence rising. Another aspect is out of blood. When someone is ashamed, they feel flushed as if they are burning up. In fact, it is the consciousness of guilt they feel at that moment as the blood rises in the face. This is a certain giveaway as understood in the expression shame face. Okay. So one who is ashamed is experiencing the fire of chaos within. Okay. Now, if I go back here, I'm just going to go up a few pages. I want to read a bit. This again is from this ebook. And it's referring to the experience of the lost in the lake of fire. I'm going to read some of this, but if you imagine a situation where you've been caught red handed, to use that expression, in a very embarrassing situation, what often happens is you flush, right? You blush. You, blush. you actually feel some heat. There's a woman here with a quite reddish face. And, you know, people really want to avoid embarrassment. People really don't like to be put on the spot or embarrassed. And there's actually a social anxiety disorder um, identified in psychiatry. And some people will even undergo surgery of their sympathetic nervous system. They also have a nerve cut that causes sweating and blushing in order to prevent blushing. They hate being embarrassed so much that they will prevent that from happening surgically. And you know, people will go to considerable lengths to avoid mental pain. But when it comes to the final judgment scene, um, being able to blush or not won't really matter. Um, so in that final lake of fire experience, uh, where the second death happens, the, the lake of fire, as I point out here, is not a place so much as it is an experience. Okay, remember a lake or water often represents people. So it's people in this situation where they're being confronted with their sins. And, um, you know, you could be caught red-handed by a peer and you might blush, but can you imagine being in the presence of someone who knows every sin you've ever committed and is quite capable of destroying you uh, for doing that? I mean, people have that attitude or belief that God will destroy them and burn them up. So they're going to experience considerable guilt and shame. Um, so when it's talking about the lost in this final judgment scene, it says a person in that situation shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. 
it's interesting that that word brimstone is eon, and it actually has to do with the presence of God. The brimstone is the presence of God. The fire is what they're experiencing from within themselves. Okay, um, let's go down. Maybe someone could read this verse, please. Ezekiel 28, 18. Okay. So you, you have this book in hard copy? I do now. I just recently got it in hard copy, yes. Okay, you'll be hearing from me. Okay. <laughs> you defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the, upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. Okay, so what is that? fire coming from Lucifer's midst, from inside him. Shame. <clears throat> okay, it's shame. It's guilt and shame. Guilt, guilt, shame. Absolutely. Um, so in that final lake of fire, and here's what most people envision the lake of fire to be, you know, actually something like water, but it's burning, it's on fire. That's not what it is, but people in that situation will experience a tremendous amount of heat, in quotes, in a sense, so guilt and shame coming from within them, they're feeling it mentally. And this relates to this verse from Romans 12. If someone could read Romans 12 20. Gary? Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Okay, so I have what, a question. what are those coals of fire? Shame, guilt. I have a question about that. Okay, sorry, go ahead, Gary. I know uh, it's in the seventh to the ninth chapter of the Song of Solomon. It says the fire of God is the love of God. And so a person that actually feeds and gives drink to his enemy is actually also showing what? love for him right, right so it could go either way there yes and i think um, in that verse you're referring to in, in solomon song of solomon doesn't it refer to love as a most vehement flame is that the verse yeah the, yeah the the very flame of god or so, yes. i think that's how it's worded yes yes and so this could be an expression of love here that it's talking about sure exactly. also yeah um you know, there's a number of places where God's love is likened to um, to fire. And what determines the outcome is our reaction to it. Do we accept it or do we reject it? And yeah. there's the, the verse in, where is it? Um, who will dwell with everlasting burnings? And it turns out it's those who are on God's side. And Satan has twisted yeah. it totally around to make us think that it's the lost who are going to end up in a place like this. It's, lake of fire mm -hmm. burning and causing the pain so the coals of fire are not literal they're but what they're causing is an awakening of the conscience and that awakened conscience can then make a decision and go either way either flee from god or uh, flee from him okay here's a verse on um, isaiah 13 8 I have that in my booklet, Isaiah 13, 8. Uh, Paul? And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows will take hold of them. They will be in pain as a woman in childbirth. They will be amazed at one another. Their faces will be like flames. Okay. So, like flames, uh, maybe we can say extreme blushing or something. I don't think it would be any flames as, you know, when you light a match, actually. I like this picture that I was able to put in that booklet, this face here 
you know, there's a lot of light coming down on that eyeball there and uh, a real look of sort of anguish, mental anguish. Okay, let's go back, back here. So provisions have been made in scripture by God to help us deal with and relieve feelings of guilt. And one provision is sacrifice, okay? Well, we read this already, didn't we? Um, Leviticus 5, 5 to 6. So, okay, looking at that, we read it. So when a person becomes aware of their sins, when it is known, what happens to the people? When, it, when a person becomes aware of their guilt, their own person, yeah, or their own. What happens to them? Yeah. Okay. When they yeah. when they become uh, I'm not worried that very well. When they become aware of their sin, they feel guilt. Okay, obviously. Um. And provision is made in this passage. Uh, when that happens, he will bring a trespass or a guilt offering, and a sacrifice, and the result is to make an atonement for him concerning his sin. Okay. Now, any thoughts about that? That's quite interesting. Is that how God really wants us to come into atonement with him? Um, offering I did not desire. Uh, it, seems, it seems. Sorry, go ahead, Jerry. It, it it could is it saying there that uh, once we've sinned and experienced the guilt and the shame that um, that uh, when when you bring that lamb that's an actual confession of your guilt of your sin as you know, it's the sinner who pronounces, confesses on the head. Sin starts in the head, you know, the, when he would come in the service. And then the sinner would cut the throat. And so the first step towards atonement is realizing the, the heinous nature of sin. And as seen as what it does is represented by that blood spilling out on the ground, sin takes the life. And that is the first step in recognizing that, that brings us to God uh, uh, to confess it and, and, and ask for his forgiveness to be uh, redeemed and healed of it. Okay, good. Um, Does that yeah, make sense? Yes, yes, that makes sense. Um, so it actually says, make an atonement for him. Um, you know, if I if I go out and do something bad and I feel guilty and estranged from God, am I looking for a, a lamb or some little animal to take the life of so I can feel better about my relationship with God? I'm not going to do that. But we need to recognize that this was a provision. Okay, Paul, go ahead. I'll go ahead and finish. I was just to say, we need to recognize this was a provision made by God to help those people realize that they could be forgiven. Uh, Judy quoted uh, Psalm 40, verse 6, I think it is, a sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not. Did not, Did not desire, okay? Mm -hmm. It's not God's first option, but he met people where they were in their culture where sacrifices to the gods are made all the time to appease their wrath. And so he provided this um, as sort of a on a stop gap or a step in helping them to realize they're forgiven, but it was certainly not his ideal. Okay, Paul, go ahead. I was just going to say that one of the problems with these uh, sacrifices is people did it without having their heart in the right place. It was just something to do to make them feel better, I guess, but they didn't really um, really have their heart in it they weren't probably re really repenting the way god wanted them to repent because they would probably do the sacrifice and then turn around and go back and do the same actions um 
But one problem with people repenting and not repenting is that they justify um, their sins. Like if they hurt somebody, they'll, they'll justify it to themselves by saying that that person deserved it. And, and that prevents a lot of people from repenting because they justify whatever sin they're doing in their own mind. Um, like that person needed it or I needed this. So this is why I stole it. And I needed it more than that person that had it. Right. So it's a vicious uh, cycle of, of iniquity, I guess. <clears throat> yeah, we anyway, to, that's uh, all I have to say. Tend to justify our actions. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Gary, you had your hand up. Yeah. Here's a question that I have about all that. If the lie that in justice, that in God's justice, that if a person transgresses the law, that blood is required, then how is a system that teaches through sacrifice that God demands blood going to cause that person not to run from God when it's that very lie in the first place that calls the disconnect. How is a disconnect or the teaching of a disconnect going to fix that? I mean, it doesn't make much sense. In other words, it's a lie that caused the split. And so we're going to use another lie to fix it. It seems to me, you know, God demanding the blood, whichever way, you know, that is typified is still a lie. And it Fundamentally, fundamentally, the character of God remains unchanged. He's seen as a dictator or a carnivore like a lion, a leopard, or a bear, or a wolf in sheep's clothing. You see what I'm saying? And yeah. so I, I, tend, I tend to think that these passages like this is what Adrian has said in many places. He said that this is God causing our sin to abound. That's our sin right there that God demanded blood and that God is showing us what that sin is in order that what we might acknowledge that sin and know what that sin will do to us as typified in that offering and therefore ask for forgiveness, you know, and cause us to want to change, to want to get rid of it, to not want to do it and seek after God instead of run away from. So I don't, I haven't been able to reconcile using a lie to fix a lie. You understand what I'm saying? That's yep. that in, in that to me. And so I see it saying a totally different thing than what I used to see it as saying. Yeah. Does that I, make sense? Or I, am I, I just would, I totally lost my mind? Yeah. I would kind of explain it this way. Um, you know, we, we mentioned, you know, God does not desire sin or sorry does not desire sacrifice um in hebrews is told we're told the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins etc there's a number of verses like that yeah. but man because of satan's influence because of think of the israelites in, in their culture the influence of the people around them and their customs believed that sin could only be remedied or forgiven by the shedding of blood. So God, here's a word that I'm big on. It's accommodation. God accommodated man's beliefs or met him where he was by giving this sacrificial system so man could even have a hope of believing that God would forgive him. And another aspect of this, causing sin to abound is important too. You mentioned that, Gary. Um, the old, we tend to think of the old testament and the new testament the old covenant and new covenant as two dispensations of time like god saved in one way for the cross another way after the cross and it's much better to recognize that the old and the new <clears throat> are just two stages in each person's experience so we need to recognize that we are sinners um, and that's really the old testament um, message you know, we're sinners in need of salvation. And um, I'm losing a train of thought here. In the New Testament, okay, 
the Old Testament was causing sin to abound, causing it to abound in our awareness. So we become more aware that, yes, we are sinners who have transgressed God's law. So sin, it's not that God wants sin to increase or be more of it. He just wants us to understand it, that we are sinners. And that then allows his grace to take effect. Um, let's turn to Romans 5.20, I think is the verse I'm thinking of. Just for a minute here. Yeah, that's the one. I'm already there. You want me to read it? Yeah, okay. Go ahead, Paul. <laughs> Moreover, that the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Okay, good. So I would read that as, moreover, the law entered our understanding, our awareness, our consciousness, that our knowledge of our sins might become more apparent to us. So we could really realize and understand that we're sinners. And therefore, we feel a greater need for grace, a greater openness to it, and we can accept it more readily. Okay, I think that's what that's talking about. Um, after all that, I think, Dorothy, you had your hand up at one point. Do you remember what that was? Yeah, uh, I was just going to uh, kind of uh, ask about the provision made from God that we could be forgiven. Uh, I, I think that it starts with our repentance, That's that we have to be repentant. I mean, there's a lot of evil in this world, and if they don't repent, then it doesn't apply to them. But it applies to the Christians that do repent. And that's a big starting point, which is, in my opinion, uh, the really important. Yeah. And um, the repentance has a lot to do with this, <clears throat> the law entering our understanding. And we will repent because we realize that we have sin, right? And that we need to make a change. So it's very much connected there. Good. <clears throat> um, so what, what then, kind of to summarize this, what is the purpose of this um, guilt offering that people are offering here in Leviticus 5? What is that meant to do? Remove the guilt, I would think. Okay, remove the guilt, remove the guilt and shame. Anything else? Well, wasn't it more for them to appreciate that their actions resulted in the death of something? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right and through that sacrifice. Yes. That's yes. rather, rather, right? That's, that, that's so, uh, sin is so enormously terrible that life was, was taken. But Gary, I have a question for Gary. Gary, your concern is that offering a system of offering was actually instituted, right? Which resulted in the shedding of blood? Yes. Right. Well, I'm hung up on that a little bit too, uh, actually. I, I, you know, we're told that God instituted that system. Well, the, the, the only, uh, the only, place that I tend to differ with others on it is, yes, I believe that God instituted, but it was primarily and foremost to point out what our sin is, which is what? Believing that God is a dictator who will kill you if you don't love and obey him. Mm -hmm. And that this offering here is a pictorial, an actual real life expression of what is in our mind, our picture of God, and that picture is sinful, which is what? God requires blood before forgiveness. And so I um, haven't been able yet to say that that is good, because to me, that is the cause of the bad. And therefore, you know, I have trouble reconciling that with God using that and saying, I'm going to forgive you by using the thing that caused you to run away from me and hide from me. It would seem to me to do that would to make the thing even worse. So I tend to think that God is saying, hey, this is your sin. This is your problem. You've got a wrong picture of me. 
as represented in these offerings and what's going on here. Repent of that. And that's, I, so I tend now when I read all of those places about the sacrifice, that's 10, that's the way that I tend uh, to understand them uh, as, as the purpose. So I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this upcoming book that Adrian said it's going to be a few months. He's coming out with it on the atonement and he'll probably, you know, get in depth with uh, a lot more of that, maybe bringing some of the stuff in. Thanks. Okay, so I I think I'll just mention these terms again, accommodation and causing sin to abound. I think that has a lot to do with it. But Gary, you're kind yes. of emphasizing, the, can I say it this way, the sin of incorrectly believing God's character. Right. Right. And let me just bring this up if I can get it here. On my website, and I think it's right here. Uh, I guess I took it down. <clears throat> Is that a picture of the, uh, the guys cleaning up the mess on the floor from a sink overflowing? And I don't know if you've seen that, Gary. And the sink is overflowing because the tap is turned on and water is flowing into it at a great rate. And I liken that to the misunderstanding of God's character. And in a sense, that is the fundamental sin. Um, we don't normally think of something like that as a sin, but in a sense, that's the basis of our problems. Uh, go ahead, Axel. Yeah, I have a question. Did, did Adam have a misinterpretation or misunderstanding of God's character? Because um, from what I've read, he he was not deceived. I mean, there was that constant interaction between Christ and, and Adam and heaven and Adam, but Adam willfully sinned. So was not that sacrifice a reflection of indicating to him, bringing to, to his consciousness that this is the cause of your actions as opposed to bringing to his understanding the character of God because he, he was sinless. He willfully gave in to sin. He willfully sold the planet, you know, humankind to, to, to that godlessness. Not that he did not have an understanding of God. At least that's my interpretation from what I've read in scripture and spirit of prophecy. Okay, um, I would start with this. Um, when God came to Adam in the garden after their sin, what did Adam do? He hid. He hid. He hid. So right there indicates to me that he had, a, at that point at least, a misconception of the character of God. Um, God was coming to... Um, help him deal with his problem, I guess you could say. And Adam thought, I don't know if it's this extreme, but he may have thought as extreme as, I better hide because God's come to kill me. Yeah. Because. Because the, he said, you eat of that tree and you'll die. Yes. Uh, so there was a misunderstanding. Could it, Go ahead. What about if it were because of shame? Um. Because he said, I, I, if I'm correct, I heard you in the garden and then I, I hid myself. Is it, is it because of shame? Because I was naked. Yeah, because I was naked and the naked. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it probably very much relates to the shame. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking the consequences would have been measured up by, by God himself as opposed to their own actions bringing about the consequences. Well, it was, a, it was a misunderstanding of that, you shall surely die, I think, it goes back to that, because what God was saying is the consequence 
of turning from me will be eventually certain death. And yeah. it seems possible that was misinterpreted as I, God, am going to kill you. Arbitrarily, yeah. Yeah, because he was afraid <laughs> of God. What he should have been yeah. afraid of that he now couldn't avoid was the consequences of eventually going old and dying. Um, that was a sure consequence. Uh, you reap what you sow. Um, but it was misinterpreted, yeah. and Satan certainly didn't help in that. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Uh, Gary. Um, I, I thought about that, that Axe was talking about, and it's interesting how the devil used a miracle. I mean, he's there, and, and the insinuation is, hey, Eve, have you ever seen a serpent talk before? It's a miracle. And he used a miracle to try to get her to believe that disobedience to the law of God does not hurt you, but it will actually enhance your experience. And so uh, uh, I find that amazing, you know, because he, he resorts to another lie, lie upon lie upon lie to uh, get man to believe that there are no inherent uh, natural consequences from disobedience. And he tried to use a miracle. He said, look, you see, I ate the fruit. I touched the fruit and look what it did to me. Moving away from God's not going to hurt you. Matter of fact, it's in your best interest. Mm -hmm. So he even used a miracle to try to back up his lie. Yes. And he was able to do that because he actually misquoted God. Because if you look in, I've got it on the screen here, Genesis 3 1. <clears throat> he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said, Ye may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And God did not say, Don't touch it. It was don't eat of it. So here's here's the serpent holding on to it, touching it, and it was not dying. So he drops it into Eve's mm -hmm. hand. Mm -hmm. Eve, oh, I'm not dead. You know, maybe God wasn't telling me the right thing here. Um, but Satan has, has used miracles and deception absolutely all the way along. Um, let's move on a little bit if we can. Um, So, okay, here's a good question. When we've sinned, how long do we need to feel guilty about that sin? How long do we need? One second. One second. That's okay. all we need. Uh, one second in which you do what? Well, we know what we're doing. We're not stupid. <laughs> Okay, we know. One, one second, realize. One second, we realize. Well, I've done it again. Okay. No. Okay. So, how, mu how much guilt can we stand? Well, it'll eventually uh, it's the people at the end. I think, uh, Axel. <clears throat> is the question how long will the will the guilt persist, or is it? Um, how instantaneous is that feeling of guilt? Um, well, it could be either. It's, it's more the first one. How, how long do we need to feel it? Let's say it's instantaneous. We've sinned. Uh -huh. We feel guilt right away. How long do we need to continue in that s okay. sense of guilt? I don't think we as need to. As long as there's no repentance. At all until, I mean, only until you confess it and forsake okay. it and realize you're forgiven. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense, Axel. Okay, good. Yeah. 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 So it's just a matter of realizing that we've done something wrong. We feel the guilt. We need to do something about it. And we can leave that behind right away by realizing we are forgiven. Right? In fact, if we have a constant awareness of God's goodness and his forgiveness, we can almost bypass the guilt right away, right? 
And yeah. I'll, I didn't I didn't mean to put this in here, but I will. And it's pretty trite sort of example. And I've used it before in our group. Um, there was one, Judy was away one camping or something one time. And I was to go to church the next morning, Sabbath morning and bring a salad. Don't forget to make the salad. Well, I totally forgot till Sabbath morning. And suddenly it dawned on me. And I remember distinctly this, and I've related a few times because I did not feel any guilt. I did wrong, and it's kind of a minor thing, but um, the instant thought, I forgot to make the salad. God forgives me. I'm okay. You know, He was not going to hold that against me. Um, you know, we needed a salad, and I went ahead and made it. It would have been better if I'd done it the day before, but it was just, it was a very distinct feeling that, you know, God does not hold this against me. Um, better that I do the things I need to do before Sabbath so I can spend quality time with him. That's the idea of it. Um, but he does not want us to go around dragging this ball and chain of guilt with us all the time. If someone could read uh, John 8, 36, please. Who has that? Gary. Uh, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Okay. Um, maybe we could add in here free from what? Guilt. Okay, good. Gary? Sin. Free from sin, even. I think it's saying that the not that the knowledge of the character of God as demonstrated in the life and the words of Jesus, if you embrace that, you will be set absolutely free from any attached sins of cords of fear, guilt, and selfishness. It will set you free from that. Okay, good. By embracing a true knowledge of the character of God in Jesus. Okay, I was just going to add, what it's setting us free from ultimately is a misconception of God's character. Okay. Okay. That's where it all leads, is doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You have a point? Well, I was just going to say, verse 32 says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So we know the truth mm -hmm. about his character that makes us free. Okay, good. So why did God give us this capacity in the first place, this capacity to feel guilt? It kind of hurts. So that we can make a choice. Okay, so we can make a choice? Yep. Okay. So it's for our good then, isn't it? Yes. And, and the good of everyone else. Yes, we can. Uh, There's kind of a parallel to pain. He gave us the capacity to feel pain. And pain is not a good thing. Um, we don't think of it as a good thing, but it's good in that it warns us something is going wrong, perhaps, in our body. And we can do something about it. So there's uh, quite a sense in which it's in which pain and guilt are parallel. One is dealing with physical pain, the other is dealing with mental, emotional pain. Um, we can talk a little more about uh, guilt, thinking of where it comes from. Uh, let's look at this term accuser. Um, guilt is activated often by an accusation okay and we've already related the cases where Yeshua did not accuse he did not bring up sins uh, he was not trying to embarrass anyone um, the guilt is kind of an inner thing just like our pain is an inner function of our body let's read uh, Revelation 12 10 Somebody have that? Oh, Paul. Yeah. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Okay. So if Satan, the accuser, is accusing us isn't that, doesn't that have the potential of causing us guilt and shame? Mm -hmm. 
Is that is that a good thing? No. Mm, not if we're falsely accused, <laughs> but if it makes us turn to God, then it's a good thing. Okay. Um, Satan knows very well the sins we've committed. Hopefully, we've already had that pang of a guilty conscience and dealt with it. I think the problem here is that Satan goes goes on accusing us even after we have dealt with the sin and that is confessed and we know we're forgiven. Um, he will keep accusing us and perhaps trying to tell us that God will not forgive you. You're too rotten of a sinner and he's not forgiven you. Um, another verse along those lines is uh, Zechariah 3.1. Uh, Michael. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Okay. It's interesting that the Hebrew, the Hebrew word for resist here is the verb form of the Hebrew noun meaning Satan. Okay. And we know that Sorry. Satan is the adversary. Uh, to resist is to, you know, accuse, be an adversary of someone. Um, so he aims his accusation directly at us. And why does he do that? Why does Satan accuse us of sin? I mean, God knows what we've done. We know what we've done. To discourage us and turn us away from God. Okay. Um, yeah, he wants to discourage us, to turn us away from God, to make us think we're Unforgivable. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, let's we'll just close with a few verses here about uh, accusing and how Satan does that. Uh, Jude chapter 1 and verse 9. Got it. Okay. Yet Michael the archangel in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Okay, so Michael the archangel, Christ himself, would not accuse even Satan of what he was doing. Mm -hmm. um, John 8, 11. She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Okay, so he was not condemning this, the woman brought to him that was caught in adultery, not condemning her or accusing her. Uh, she very well knew she had sinned. And um, he came across to her as one totally forgiven. forgiven. Um, yeah. Okay, Romans 2.15. <clears throat> which show the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another okay i think this very much relates to that lake of fire situation with the fire coming forth from within them uh It'll be, for the lost, it'll be their own thoughts that are condemning them and causing them all that grief and guilt and shame. So I think the message here is that, um, you know, guilt, the capacity to feel guilt is given us by God, as pain is, in order to protect us, to help us realize uh, where we have fallen short and where we need to make things right. And... I think a good part of the message too is that we can make things right very quickly and know that he does not accuse us or condemn us. He wants us to uh, live above and beyond guilt and shame and not drag that around with us. So I find that a very reassuring thing. Um, he wants us to be free as we read in, uh, in John there. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed.
And maybe that's a good note to end on for me at least. Any other thoughts before we close? Hopefully that makes sense to you. I think it's all very good. It's been especially helpful to me. So thank you. Okay. Good, yeah, good study. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And uh, we will meet together same place, same places all over the North America <laughs> next Sabbath. And we'll continue on and I will talk with Lona about getting together with okay. her and the others. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, I'll just stop.